so the teaching uh, this morning is the importance of forgiveness. And um, if we really do, thank you so much. But if we really do look upon our own lives um, uh, in the stages, I don't know if that's the right way of saying it, but the, the steps we've taken in life, um, we can all identify with the importance of forgiveness, of healing to come about. So the greatest given, uh, the greatest forgiveness of all is God's act of forgiveness toward us, correct? Mm -hmm. His example by which he releases sinners, which we are, from judgment and frees us from the just penalty imposed against us because of our transgression against his law. Forgiveness means ceasing to feel resentment for wrongs. So that's what happens. So when, we, when forgiveness comes, we can no longer have the feeling of resentment for wrongs and offenses done toward us. It's like letting it go. The pardoning and restoration of broken relationships. Forgiveness is the act of renouncing anger and ill feelings against others. This is this is examining our own hearts. So going back to what Paul said, it's like this is examining our own hearts. This is where healing comes about. This is where it takes place. Is forgiveness. This is what God says. It's not me. This is what God says. Forgiveness between family and friends, coworkers and neighbors. God's forgiveness is the great life-changing example for us. And people who, um, I don't say this in a horrifying way, people who are older, um, who have experienced things, you know, we can testify. You look at the scriptures. Scripture testifies about the goodness of God. Scripture testifies to you and I, to the young ones, to the to the mountain, to the, to the babies, that God is faithful, that God is asking us to do it my way. Okay. When things are wrong, when things have done been done to you, things that are out of your control, God has a remedy. It's pure, pure and simple. That we may, with God's help, forgive others who have offended us. This is God's prescription for healing. This is God's prescription for the, for the healing of the heart. So that's what's important to understand. As Phil Robertson would say, don't blame me, blame the Almighty. <laughs> this is what he said. The world has a rule that the devil or enemy, that the enemy and the devil endorses, the rule of the right of revenge, getting even. Do unto others as they have done to us. Translation is revenge. That's reality. That's what the world says. That's what, the, that's what our emotions want to do. That's our, our reflexes to do that, take revenge. It's like, they're never going to learn, so I'm just going to, it's just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So the Living Translation, Matthew, Matthew 7, 12 says, which is opposite of what I just read, do for others what you want them to do for you. This is the teaching of the law of Moses. King James says in the same verse, therefore, all things, whatsoever you would, that men should do to you, do even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You see, this is me, the world has changed the meaning. It's purposely misinterpreted what you are to do. And this goes back to life-changing circumstances that, that we can be set free, insisting that those who have wronged us, we must take upon ourselves to make it right. So because the world, we can't listen to what the world has done, misinterpreted the word of God, and it's made it where it's the word of the flesh. God is saying, no, don't do it that way. Do unto others as you would have them do. Insisting that those who have wronged us, we must take upon ourselves to make it right. So God's saying, you can't wait. You can't wait to find anyone. You have to step forward on and it's not easy. It's not easy, but with God, it's it's possible. Amen. All of us are familiar with feuding relatives or neighbors. This is reality. This is life. And we kind of like, well, you know, something can, we can get kind of used to this. It's like, well, this is just life. This is just it. But God's saying, I'm familiar with this. I understand it all. And I have a remedy for it all. You don't have to carry this heavy burden. You don't. All of us are familiar with the feuding relatives or neighbors or coworkers. It could come from also from a political environment that we see today, where reason and common sense is purposely ignored 
for the sake of power and not for the common good. When I was writing this, I'm like, I was thought about John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy is like, this simple thing that inspired a nation is like, ask not what you can do for you. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. It's the same principle, the same spirit. It's like, the, the nation identifies with that because it's in the heart. It's it's a, it's what because the laws of God are written upon our heart. We know it's true. And that makes sense, right? It makes total sense. And, and then you take that and he's actually instituted it into the things of our country, where it's no longer about you, what you can get from your government. It's like, which, what can you do for your government? What can you do to make the country better? That's what it's like. It's not like a pay, a payout. It's like, you know, this and this and this. And it's like, what did I get this time? And stuff like that from the government. It's like, no. JFK is like, he was like, it resonated with the nation. It really did. It really did. Because of the same real or imagined events, refused to have any common goal of reconciliation with each other, holding grudges with people to the day they died. So this is what also would happen. That we see today where we were common sense and purposely, and they purposely ignore for the sake of power and not for the common good because of some real or imagined offense refuse to have any common goal of reconciliation. So that's something we need to examine our own hearts. So this is what it's saying here. Because of the real or imagined, it could be a real thing that you're struggling with, that, you're, that, that you have no, you can't forgive the person or whatever. Or it could be imagined. I've experienced that. Yeah. I've experienced that. I was like, that's not real. And it takes you over to a place where you're like, it's like you got, over, you got angry over nothing because it's not real, because you have conjured up in your mind about what is actually taking place. That's the um, offense refused to have any common goal of reconciliation with each other, holding grudges with people to the day they die. And that's sad. That is sad. That is sad, sad, sad. And that's where compassion for that individual comes in. Instead of just being angry, it's just like, they're, you're done with them? No, it's like, this is where compassion comes in. It's like, or people hold on to grudges until the day they die. You can't move upon that forgiveness that God is asking you to do and that he's already done for you. Apparently, without considering how their lack of forgiveness affects their own personal lives and the lives around them. So it's like, that's all forgiveness is. It's like, you've got to understand the lack of forgiveness not only affects your own personal life, right? It 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 involves the lives of all of you around, all around you. Everyone, it's like it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about how am I going to represent Christ right? That's what it's about. And it's like how you're going to reflect because that reflection is real and how people can see. So again, people can do this without apparently without considering how. Their lack of forgiveness affects their own personal lives because you're because you're not in a good place. You're in a place of struggle. You're like you're, you see no way out. You see no remedy to the situation that it is, and the lives of around that that are around them. Think of all the misery that results in our communities, even within the church, from disputes and quarrels to misunderstandings that are trivial. If you really get down to it, they really are trivial. They can't because we, we just, we throw it, we throw it, we, it's like gasoline. We put a match to the gas. Gasoline is highly flammable. And it's like, it's us. We basically made the gasoline, we make the match, and it's like, it's a like, God said, don't do it. Put it down, put it back in the box. As the box says, you know, <laughs> you close the box so it doesn't strike. It's like, keep it in a safe place. Compared with the way each of us, so compare that to the way each of us have offended God. Finger. But how do we, how do we have offended God? And God has shown us, and God has forgiven us. 
Think about that. Think about that. Compare it to the way each of us have offended God. I'm going to go to, you guys can go to Matthew 18. <clears throat> I'm going to read from the Living Translation. Verse 1, about that time, the disciples came to Jesus to ask which of them would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus called the small child over to him and set the little fellow down among them and said, unless you turn to God from your sins and become as little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, anyone who humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And, at, and any of you who welcomes a little child like this, because you are mine, is welcoming me and caring for me. Verse 6. But if any of you causes one of these little ones, talking about not just children, he's talking about you and I. We're children of God. So we got to take that into context. So, 6. But if any of you causes one of these little ones who trusts in me to lose his faith, it would be better for you to have a rock tied to your neck and thrown into the sea. Woe upon the world for all its evils. Temptation to do wrong is inevitable. But woe to the man who does the tempting. So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Better to enter heaven crippled than to be in hell with both of your hands and Nine. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Better to enter heaven with one eye than to be in hell with two. Beware that you don't look down upon a single one of these little children. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels have constant access to my father. And I, the Messiah, came to save the lost. Twelve. If a man has a hundred sheep and one wandering away and is lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others and go out into the hills to search for the lost one? And if he finds it, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 others save the home. 14. For so it is not my father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. If a brother sins against you, Go to him privately and confront him with the fault. If he listens and confesses it, you have one back to your brother. But if not, then take one of one or two others with you and go back to him again, proving everything you say to say by these witnesses. If he still refuses to listen, then take your case to the church. And if the church's verdict favors you, but he won't accept it, then the church should excommunicate him. And I tell you this, whatever you find on earth is bound in heaven, and whatever you free on earth will be free. Whatever you free, I'm sorry, whatever you free on earth will be free in heaven. 19. I also tell you this. If two of you agree down here on earth concerning anything you ask for, my father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together because they are mine, I will be right there among them. Then Peter came to him and asked, Sir, how often should I forgive my brother who sins against me? Seven times? Jesus says, No, seventy times seven. The kingdom of heaven cannot be compared to the king who decided to bring his accounts up to date. In the process, one of his, debt his debtors was brought in who owed him $10 million. That's how it says it. He couldn't pay. So the king ordered him sold for the debt. Also his wife and children and everything he had. But the man fell down before the king, his face in the dust, and said, Oh, sir, be patient with me, and I'll pay it all. Then the king was filled with pity for him and released him and forgave his debt. This is where it gets interesting. Mm -hmm. 28. But when the man left the king, he went to the man who owed him 2000 
and grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. The man fell down before him and begged him to forgive him. A little to give him a little time. Be patient. I will pay it, he pled. But his creditor wouldn't wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested, jailed until the debt would be paid in full. 31. Then the man's friends went to the king and told him what had happened. And the king called him, and the man he had forgiven and said, You evil hearted wretch, here I forgave you all the tremendous debt just because you asked me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on others just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to the torture chamber until he had paid every last penny. So shall my heavenly father give to you if you refuse to truly forgive your brothers. That's what God says. There's no um, stipulation. There's no small print that we can't see. There's no, um, uh, you don't understand, Lord. There's nothing there that I can see. Wow. Okay, three verses, three through 11. What I get is, except you be converted, change. That's what it says here in, um, I think it's in, in the King James, I think it is. Are we still in that? Yes. Yes. So in the King James, it says, and said, verse three, verily I say to you, except you be converted and become as little children, change. So God is saying you must be changed. You must be changed to become as little children. God is saying, yes, you are grown-ups, you are adults and things like that, but you must in your heart be changed. You must behave like a child of, and I consider you my child. Become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's humbleness. So God is calling us to be his children, to be humble. Because of circumstances, because of the, the things that we carry with us from our youth, which has molded our hearts, doesn't mean we have to stay there. We don't have to stay there. Because it begins with the power of God in allowing him to change our heart through his word, diving into his word, asking him to change our heart. He will change our heart. You can't do it yourself. You're not going to be able to find it through a a magazine, a book, literature, a sermon, you're not going to get it anywhere from that. You're going to get it from the word of God. You will, and through the power of prayer, because your prayers will be in alignment with God's word. In what we're reading right here, God is saying, be changed. Be as a child. Don't be like the world. The world has set itself up where a man is supposed to be angry. A man is supposed to be this. A man is supposed to be that. A man is like, be supposed to be controlling. It's like, that's not how God, God designed anything. God has not designed that at all. God has designed relationships in a perfect manner. So when we get out of alignment, everything falls apart, and you never find your way back. You never will unless you go back to the Word of God. Absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> God is referring to us as his children. So be careful and beware. It's like you and I, you and I, you and I. If I treat you badly, I think I was that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Or if I even like talk behind your back or something like that, that's. It's, 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 you got to really guard your heart. You really have to. Peter seems to. So uh, in verse 21, after listening to Jesus, right? We're going to go to verse 21 where Peter's like, heard it all, right? He's heard the master. He's heard the Messiah. He's heard the king. After listening to Jesus, Peter seems to be reasoning, well, there must be a limit to how often we are to forgive, right? Peter asks, is seven times good enough? Is that sufficient? It's, it's like looking for that stipulation or that little, uh, that, that line I can't, can't see too well in the, 
in the scriptures that there must be some kind of way out of this. <clears throat> so 23, the example of the compassionate king, that's where we're going to 23 now. So the example of the compassionate king, a man is brought before the king with a heavy debt to be paid to you and I. Mm -hmm. Legally ordered, so he's, he's legally bound to the law, the, 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 the judge or the king, with justice. And it's, if it's not paid, justice will be served. There's a verdict. Is he guilty? Yes. What's the penalty to that man that refused to have the same compassion as the king did toward him? This is what the justice, this is what God's justice deserves. The man, the man fell down with his face in the dust. He said, be patient with me and I will pay it all. And the king was filled with pity for him. The king released him and forgave him his debt and it was wiped clean. Knowing that this man's debt would never be able to pay, this man would not be ever be able to pay that massive debt. So there's nothing that that man could do. He threw himself in the dust and he goes, he begged for mercy. So that's what that man did. So when the man who had actually would refuse to forgive the man who owed him, now he's before the king again, mm. right? So somebody went and told the king, it's like, this guy is not being fair. He's not acting with compassion and mercy. And so the king goes, bring him to me. Here's the scary part. The man forgiven had no pity toward a man who owed him. He grabbed him. This is, this is, this is just awful. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. He was arrested and held until the debt was paid, which means the debt would never be paid. He's forever in slavery. He's forever in bondage. In that place because he was not able to forgive. The forgiveness aspect and the things that this man is doing right here, not able to forgive the debt that was owed him, you're never going to escape unless you act with compassion and mercy, Amen. even when we don't deserve it. Amen. That man in the beginning did not deserve it. That man, when the, when the king first addressed that man, he didn't deserve it. Next, Bring in the next one because I'm passing judgment. God in, his, God in his mercy goes, he asked for forgiveness. He's like, please give me, give me some more time. And the, man, and the king goes, yeah, you got it. I see your heart. I see that you're looking for, uh, that you're remorseful. You're sorry. You're going to make this right. The king goes, yeah, but your debt is forgiven. You don't have to pay me anything. That's the amazing thing. It's like, I'm not going to give you more time. Come back in a year, and if you have it, okay, we'll, we'll do installments or whatever. You know? it's, kind of, it's done. It's wiped clean. That's the beauty of this. It's like, well, if you, if you add that up, you put that together, it's like when it comes to forgiveness, that's the beauty. That's the message of this for me is that man did not show that forgiveness for the one who owed him. He said, he instantly reached and grabbed his neck, reached out in anger. You're going to pay and you're going in jail until you pay it. So the king, which represents Christ or God and or, and or God, it's like, what? We are as individuals to show that same mercy, that same forgiveness. Amen. That's the beauty of it. And God's saying, just do that. Do it because it honors me. It brings glory to me. It's what the word of God says to do. We as people are going, we don't understand. It's like, yes, he does. God does understand. God does understand. Verses 31 to 34. All of us have received unbelievable forgiveness from our father in heaven. God's word in Matthew is is explaining to us we should never be slow to forgive. It shows us that forgiveness ought to go both ways. All believers have received it. 
and should be willing to give it. Forgiveness means the expectation of what you think should happen after. I wasn't planning on this, but there's something that I hope Debbie allows me to share. Is when um, when we first got married, I remember Debbie goes, "I gotta, I gotta ask for forgiveness from my ex-husband." I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay. I, I'm the, I didn't question her. I'm like, well, Debbie, you know, she deserves that. No, it's like I saw her heart. She said, I got to I got to tell him. I'm like, to myself, I'm like, why? What did you do wrong? Because she saw the wrongs in her own heart. I didn't see that she did. She saw what she needed to ask for forgiveness for. She, it wasn't dependent. It wasn't stiff. There was no expectation that he was going to, well, no, it's not Debbie. I'm sorry. No, she did it out of fear of God and the fear of what, of who he is and to offer forgiveness that he was just, she was saying, I, for, I wish you would forgive me. I think that's what you said. You're actually asking him to forgive you. That's what it was. And he's just like, not responsive. He's just like, Tweet. basically, you know, older than thou, you're always been that way and stuff like that. And it's just like, and Debbie did it out of a good heart. And it, what it does, it's uh, it does it, what she was doing is what God asked us to do, and that took courage. It took it took a, a fear of God, a fear of God, and not of Him. She didn't care what His response was going to be. She wasn't expecting Him to 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 take the forgiveness. He just said, "Whatever." Okay. Mm-hmm. What can we learn here? One. The readiness to forgive others is a sign of repentance. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. The readiness to forgive others is a sign of repentance. As Jesus taught Peter, there are no limits we should be set that should be set on it. We are to forgive not just when not just seven times, but 70 times seven, which basically means continually. Mm -hmm. The Jewish practice. At that time, and even before, is to forgive three times, and after that, they're done. <laughs> it's like there's no more forgiveness. T- take it from Amos uh, chapter one, verse three. Then they take that from uh, Amos chapter one, verse three. It says, King James, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Peter may have thought seven times was super generous. That's enough. <laughs> it's like, I'm being generous, Lord. It's like, I'm not doing it just three times. and then seven times. It's like, you look it over. But Jesus places no limit to our forgiveness to others. So let's go to Ephesians 4. Let me know when you're there. I'm going to read from the living. Then throw off your old evil nature, the old you, the old you that was a partner in your evil ways, rotten through and through, full of lust and shame. 23. Now your attitudes and thoughts must be constantly changing for the better. Yes, you must be a new and different person, holy and good. Clothe yourselves with this with this new nature. It's like God is asking you to put it on. Twenty-five. Stop lying to each other. Tell the truth. We are parts of each other, and when we lie to each other, we are hurting ourselves. If you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Don't let the sun go down with your while you're still angry. Get over it quickly. For when you are angry, you give a mighty foothold to the devil. Recognize your enemy. That's what God is saying here. Recognize who you're dealing with. You're not dealing with whoever's in front of you. You have to recognize you're dealing with something who's trying to entice you. Don't recognize that person as the devil. Recognize who's trying to entice you, to cause you to react violently, relax, 
in regards to you know, verbal things like that. Uh, but God is asking you to recognize who's trying to light your match, who's trying to ignite the flame. 28, if anyone is stealing, he must stop it and begin using those hands of his for honest work so he can give to others in need. 29, don't use bad language. Say only what is good and helpful to those you are talking to and what will give them a blessing. That throws the enemy off, off, uh, off balance when you do that. They say the devil's going to well, what where'd that come from? You didn't you didn't you didn't uh, you didn't put the match to the uh, to the gasoline here. It's like that's not how it's supposed to work. Don't cause the Holy Spirit sorrow by the way you live. Remember, he is the one who marks you to be present on that day when salvation from sin will be complete. 31. Stop me in me, bad temper and anger. Quarreling harsh words and dislike of others should have no place in your life. God's saying that. God is saying that's how holy we are. That's how we pursue holiness. And when we, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. You're battling these things. That's why Paul is, that yeah, he's so animated. Examine your own heart because your heart is wicked. Because God, through his Holy Spirit, is the one that convicts the heart. It's like, and God is using that. God's using the Holy Spirit with the word of God. Stop being mean because the Holy Spirit is one. Is this getting you anywhere? Are you happier? Are you, is it any better for you when everybody's crying, when people are angry, things like that? You know, your neighbor's gone off and it's like, seems justified by you confronting your neighbor about something, God forbid. But it's like, is anything settled? No, you just basically live in lit a torch, you lit a match to gasoline. Stop. God is saying this. Stop being mean, bad temper. God is, God's not saying, but God's not putting any stipulation. He's not saying this. He's not saying, he's not saying, well, this happens and it's okay to do this. God's not saying that at all. Never. There's no excuse. Stop being mean, bad, bad temper, and anger. I'm not saying this, right? God is saying this. Quarreling harsh words and dislike of others should have no place in our lives. God is saying that. Instead, be kind to each other. And that's what Debbie did. That was an example. First Mary, I knew she was I knew she loved God. I knew she loved God by more than I knew that. And that was an example for me. It was like, and that's 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 what it's all about. Instead, be kind to each other, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even though he, her husband, that's something we never did. We never spoke ill about her father. Never, ever, 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 ever. Um, because that's something I grew up with. I understood that. God showed me that when I was to my mom, my mom, and even my dad. She never spoke ill about my mom. And my mom never spoke ill about him. My my dad, that's what that was just, I have to just thank God for this because my dad always goes, your mom did such a wonderful job. He always said that. I had that. Some people don't have that. That shows the strength that God can give you is that God can do also encourage you. He can encourage you in the same way. It's like, because the truth is the truth. When I was blessed with that, but God is telling you that as parents. God is telling you that as husbands and as wives. Is that you are doing a good job when you do it my way. And that doesn't mean that God's just like, just do it my way, and that's the way it is. No, do it my way and see what happens. That's it. You don't see it. You don't understand it. You can't foresee it. But God is saying, do it my way and see what happens. So again, instead, of be, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven you. Because you belong to Christ. Because you belong to Christ. Amen. <laughs>
failure to forgive does bring consequences. So failure to forgive does bring consequences. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. Would you like to go there? I'll wait for you for a second. I'm going to read from the King James. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. You there? Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Here's the stipulation that God gives us. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's not, I'm not telling you that. This is not me saying this is how it is. God isn't telling us out of kindness, out of mercy, and of love. He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, just as your heavenly father forgave you, just like the king that we read in Matthew 18. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And I'm not bringing any glory. I'm just thankful for my wife. That's that's what that's what that's, these scriptures right here are, are embedded in her heart for her to do what she did. The world has tempted, um, has attempted to water down the meaning of what we just read by giving us excuses or believing that we have an excuse, inserting uh, man-made escape clauses, meaning it doesn't apply to me. In my situation, you can't get away from that. That is not true. It never has, it never will be. Jesus clearly is saying that there will be no forgiveness for unforgiving, unforgiving people. That's what it says. Again, don't blame me. Every one of us is indebted to God. He forgives when when we repent. He forgives when we repent. Scripture is shown is showing us we must practice forgiveness toward each other. Practice, practice, following them. Practice means getting better, and better, and better, and better. You get you, that's what athletes do, right? God help us to see when we are holding grudges, bitter feelings toward other people. To forgive does not mean that we excuse the sinful offense. To forgive does not mean that we, we excuse the sinful offense. When we forgive another person, it does not mean we are excusing the sin. Sin is always sin. But forgiveness ends. This is the key. This is, this is where it always applies to us. This is where it all sets us free. But forgiveness ends. It ends the bitterness, the anger, and the resentment. That's what happens to us when we forget. It ends the bitterness, the anger, and the resentment. It does, because the Holy Spirit's working within us. We must develop and maintain the capacity to forget. <clears throat> this, I'm going to read. This is from a gentleman that I'll, I'll let you know. So this is this. What I'm going to read right here is from a gentleman that everyone knows. We must develop and maintain the capacity to forget. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is, listen to this, is devoid of the power to love. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. Martin Luther King Jr. said that. So these, these truths that he said here, are rooted in the scriptures. His meaning, without forgiveness, we take away our power to love others. It all comes from here. All the power to love others comes from here. It's to be in obedience to what the word of God says. When we struggle to do it, God is faithful to do it. Because he changed, he's changing our hearts. I see that. I see that in all of us. I really do. I see that. I really do. I see the change. It's a testimony for God. It really is. Our flesh does not want to let those, those who hurt us off the hook, correct? Our flesh, our, 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 our person, our flesh does not want to let those who hurt us off the hook. 
Why? Because we may think that we may be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. What we think, right? It's like it's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. I'm going to get beat up again in the sense of whatever. That's a real concern because if only could, but because the person, because, they're, because they don't want to be taken advantage again, because if only they can feel my pain or know what they have and how they have hurt me. So it just goes back and forth. It goes back and forth. And this is reality. This is, this is for me. I've experienced all this stuff. It's like you guys, I don't know if you guys are saints, but I'm not. It's like in my life, these are things that we all struggle with. It's like, it's like workplace, things like that. It's like, no, you're not going to get, you're not going to It's like, you, don't you know who you're talking to and stuff like that? No, it's like, God is not asking us to behave that way. You are to respect and honor. There's another, there is a wall that makes it so difficult to forgive. What's that wall? Anybody? What's the wall that, that prevents us for, to forgive? Yeah. Fear. 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 Fear of being vulnerable. Yeah. That's real. Yeah. Fear of not being in control. That's real. Yeah. Because that that's 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 the big thing. That's huge for me. Huge for us. Re recognize why. It's like because as men, men were like all oh, big and strong and stuff like that. And it's like whatever. You know, some people are stronger than others. <laughs> some men, obviously. but um, but. It's the what the world has offered us as men, as husbands, as fathers, is not to be vulnerable, it's not to be honest and not to be truthful, not to rely upon your friend, your spouse, as you're supposed to rely upon them. You know, because God says there's that perfect order that God has given. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness shown in God's word empowers you into the first steps in being set free from the painful past forgiveness shown in god's word by doing it his way has empowered you has empowered you it has not made you weak it has not made you uh, uh somebody to be walked on you're not going to be walked on anymore because god is with you whether you understand it or not can comprehend it right now no because god is with you and you're standing upon his truth you're not standing upon the world's truth you're standing upon his truth. So I'm going to repeat it again. Forgiveness shown in God's word empowers you in the first steps in being set free. Set free from the painful past. And God will lead you to a new beginning. That's the promise. That's the belief that God is showing us in his word. God is showing us in his word. You know, I, I'm just going to use Debbie and I. It's like, where we were and things like that. It's like God has given us a new beginning. That's how I look at it. God has given us a new beginning with each other. And that's how we ought to see it because God did it. Even with all of our called baggage, things like that, it's just like God's just like, just do it my way. Mm -hmm. Do it my way. Mm -hmm. Do it. Just do it. You don't understand how it's gonna happen. You don't understand, you can't comprehend it. Because we want to know it now. This is what I always hear. I want to know. I want to know. I want to see it. I want to be able to know the plan. I want to see the writing. I want it all spelled out for me. That's what great bosses do. You know, a lot of so-called great bosses. They want it all. Write it out for me. <laughs> so I did. So I can actually do it. Forgiveness isn't where you wait for the other person to apologize or say, I'm sorry. The fact is, there's a possibility they may never apologize. But if your forgiveness is dependent upon them reaching out first, you will be enslaved to sorrow. That's the truth of the matter. That I want you to I want you to really think about that. Write it down because I think it's that important. Forgiveness isn't where you wait for the other person to apologize or say I'm sorry. The fact is they may never apologize. They may never. They never. If your forgiveness is dependent. If you to forgive them is dependent upon them reaching out first or even saying they're also sorry, you will be enslaved to sorrow. So it's like just reach out and just do it mm -hmm. because God is asking you to do it. Amen. You're set free. You're no longer bound to it anymore. Mm -hmm. 
That's the freedom. That's it. And I'm not trying to embarrass. I'm really not because it's a testimony for how I am to live. Is how she did. It's like she wasn't expecting. She didn't know what to expect. She was she knowing the man. It's just you know, blow up on the phone, hang up, slam the phone. Who knows? But she did it. And it was just a beautiful thing. I remember I was standing right over here, and she's over there by the phone. Over there. I'm going to leave you with this. Forgiveness is one of the highest of virtues. Why? Because it reflects the character of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for uh, your your holy word. God, um, Lord, help us, Lord, to just uh, to rest in your word. Yes, Lord, help us, Lord, to believe what your word says, that it does apply to us as individuals. Every individual here, Lord, it does apply to you. every single one. Everyone. God, it, re it applies to everyone. It doesn't say, well, it's like, that's not for that person, it's not for that person. It's, but God, it does. It's for everyone, wherever they're at. So God, help us, Lord, because God, we will be set free from that, from that bondage, from that slavery. Lord, God, just thank you so much, Lord. God, you have set us free from your word, through your word, through your word, Lord. And God, um, we're grateful, Lord, for what it means, thank you, Lord. And um, if God is for us, he can be against us. Amen. So God, we thank you. God, I pray that you would just steal this uh, message that is from your word. Uh, in our hearts, Lord, that we can be be able to be changed. Lord, it's, it's not of ourselves. Our, that's why our dependence is so great upon you. It's so dependent upon you for us to be, to do these things, to be as, um, as you've shown us. Yes. So, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, we're going to a time of prayer. And also, Lord, we're going to go into um, uh, <coughs> communion. God, I pray, um, Lord, that let me read this real quick. <laughs> this is what we are to do. First Corinthians eleven twenty four, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, I'm going to read it and we'll read it again. Take and eat this, my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me, 25. After the manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament. In my blood this is to do. Is this, is this do you? As often as you drink it, your remembrance of me, 26. Mm -hmm. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come, 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat, this is, this is, this is, I want you guys to pray about this before we do this, because God is saying this in his word, and this goes for me and all of us. <clears throat> Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup in the Lord unworthily, Unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. 28. But let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. <clears throat> For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So Debbie, if you would go ahead and thank you. So I want you to pray about that. And I think we should always ponder this, pray about it, um, examine our hearts, and then we can't partake. We are free to partake when we examine our hearts. This is what we ought to do. Not just in remembrance, but also to do it in a manner that we would um, desire um, our hearts to be changed.
and then we can 